So starting with farm cash income for the broadacre sector as a whole, uh, in 2017-18, we're looking at a 12% decline from last year's record figure to an average of $191,000 per farm. So while that's down on last year, it's still very healthy, uh, second highest on record, and around 32% above the 10-year average. So when we look by industry, uh, we can see some substantial differences. Uh, farm cash income for wheat and other crop farms has come off substantially from the record achieved last year, uh, mainly as yields have returned to more no normal levels um, and prices have remained reasonably soft. Uh, on average, farms in the beef industry had a pretty similar year to last year in terms of income. Uh, prices have fallen by quite a bit, uh, although they remain well above average. And the effects of those lower prices has been offset somewhat by higher turnoff this year, following herd rebuilding over the last couple of years, and there's a bit less grass around at the moment. The sheep industry uh, continues to be a shining light. Uh, in real terms, this is the highest um, farm cash income we've seen in at least 20 years, driven by really solid prices for wool and lamb um, and greater production of sheep, meat and wool. So this is what um, some of the key commodity prices have been doing. As I was saying, uh, wheat prices remain pretty low by historical standards. Uh, that's mainly because of global supply and demand situation. Uh, there's quite a bit of wheat around at the moment. Um, beef prices remain above the 10-year average but have fallen by about 15% in 2017-18. That's mainly because of a global downturn in beef prices as US producers increase turnoff after a couple of years of herd rebuilding. And lamb and wool prices are well above average and they've been growing strongly. Uh, significant increases in wool prices come from strong demand for fine and super fine wool, uh, while sources of demand are limited. So obviously that's benefited specialist sheep farms, but it's also supported returns on many cropping farms. We've seen a big turnaround uh, in farm cash income in dairy from 2016-17. From so farm cash income's up significantly to $137,000 per farm. That's about 8% above the 10-year average. And that improvement's mainly because of increased milk prices. So it's been a relatively tough couple of years in the dairy industry. And while this increase in farm cash income's obviously very welcome, the global market for milk remains pretty well supplied. So there's some risks on the downside in the next couple of years. And, and a lot will depend on the value of the Australian dollar. If it comes down relative to the US, then our milk becomes more competitive on the global market, which supports farm gate milk prices, and the reverse is true if the dollar rises. So you'll hear more about that in the dairy session later this afternoon. So while farm cash income is down from last year in most states, uh, farm performance is still very strong. So this map compares uh, projected farm cash income for the current financial year uh, using data and information we had up until about the end of January with the average for the previous 10 years. So in southern Australia, regions dominated by grain production generally have farm cash incomes just above the longer term average, that's the light blue areas, or in some cases below the longer term average, the red areas. So other regions where farm cash incomes projected to be below the longer term averages includes Western Queensland, following several uh, dry years and high cattle turnoff. And there are regions in northeastern New South Wales um, and Tasmania where dry conditions in 2017-18 have reduced incomes. At the same time though, there are still many regions that are expected to have uh, incomes in the current year that are well above the average for the previous decade. So the dark blue areas on this map are projected to have incomes more than 75% above the longer term average. So most of these are beef cattle or sheep producing regions. Prolonged dry conditions in central western Queensland are expected to result in increased cattle turnoff and boost incomes in 2017-18, but result obviously in a reduction in cattle inventories and that will affect incomes in coming years. So the theme of the conference this year is creating value in an increasingly connected world, 
So I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about a survey we ran last year into the use of information and communication technology on Australian farms. So we expect that farmers will increasingly use ICT-based tools to perform a variety of tasks, like communicating with their suppliers and customers, making management decisions, um, operating equipment. So the survey we've undertaken gives us some insight into the current levels of investment and use of technologies, as well as some of the impediments that farmers face. So in 1998, when we last surveyed farmers about ICT use, 30% uh, reported owning a computer. 20 years later, 90% uh, of farms own a computer. So as you'd expect, ICT assets currently represent a relatively small share of farm capital and investment at around 3% of plant and equipment capital and less than 0.2% of all capital, including land. So there's a bit of variation across the industries. Uh, most obviously, broadacre livestock, so sheep and beef farms, appear to have a lower proportion of ICT assets than others. And we can also see that livestock, dairy and vegetable farmers were investing in ICT a bit more heavily than they had in the past, with ICT's share of investment higher than its share of assets. The type and value of ICT assets varies across industries, mainly reflecting the availability of technologies to suit particular production systems. So the most, the most striking example of this is the widespread use of GPS-guided tractors and harvest monitoring technologies on cropping farms, which is the main reason this industry has the highest overall value of ICT assets. So wheat and other crop farms held ICT assets with an estimated replacement value of $33,000, with around 80% of that value in GPS equipment. ICT-based technology is increasingly available in livestock industries to manage stock, um, including electronic identification systems combined with satellite monitoring, but adoption of these technologies is currently limited uh, and mostly concentrated on intensive livestock industries such as dairy, where we see relatively high investment in sensors and other equipment to monitor individual animal productivity. So we know that farmers will uptake technologies where they see a relative advantage. But if the gains aren't going to be substantial and realised quickly, and if considerable learning is expected, uh, then we know that adoption won't be quick. So you can see this with the rapid uptake of auto steer, um, but the relatively slower uptake of variable rate precision agriculture. When we look across farms by size, we see that larger farms tend to do most of the investment in ICT. So this is consistent with what we observe for investment on farms more generally. So the example here is for dairy, but the trends in the other sectors are similar. And you can also see that larger dairy farms invest in different assets, most likely sensors and automated feeding and milking equipment. So in the survey, we also asked people what the barriers uh, to adoption were. And as, as you'd expect, uh, cost was an issue, um, but it wasn't seen as the major impediment. So across all broadacre farms, lack of sufficient internet access was the most commonly reported constraint to the adoption of new ICT equipment. Other limitations included the operator's skills and the availability of new technologies. Livestock and dairy farmers frequently reported that a lack of required skills was a constraint. So partly, this might be because livestock and dairy farmers are on average older, and across all industries, older farmers more frequently reported skills as a constraint uh, than younger farmers did. Um, in any case, uh, this indicates there may be a role for industry and technology providers to work more closely in delivering information and education that gives farmers the confidence and skills necessary to adopt. Some CSIRO work shows that adoption of cropping practices on grain farms has been strongly associated with the use of agronomy advisory support. So the significant growth in expenditure on advisory services in the grains industry since about the mid-1990s might have helped encourage greater investment there. 
And it might be one of the reasons behind lack of skills being less of an impediment on cropping farms than in other industries. On vegetable farms, uh, nothing new of interest was the most commonly reported constraint, followed by cost. The lower reporting of internet access as an impediment on vegetable farms reflects the different types of internet connection and mobile coverage available to farms in different locations. The survey showed that internet connection type varies quite a bit, mainly reflecting the location of the different industries. So broadacre farms had a relatively high reliance on satellite and mobile wireless connections, while dairy farms had more access to fixed wireless. Vegetable farms reported the highest percentage of farms able to access DSL, uh, likely because they're generally located in less remote regions. And farmers reported substantial difficulties in accessing the internet. So over 55% of broadacre farms, 40% of dairy farms, and 35% of vegetable farms reported an impediment to their business operations as a result of mobile phone or internet issues. Our survey also showed that on average, farmers have just under half their farms covered by wireless or mobile data. So farm coverage was lowest for broadacre farms, which averaged around 45% of the farm covered. Vegetable and dairy farms averaged around 65%. So the main concerns people raised with their internet was speed and reliability followed by cost, especially for farms relying on mobile wireless and satellite. Coverage and reliability were the most frequently reported problems with the mobile phone network. So some farmers are finding innovative ways to get the internet where they need it. Um, a number of farms we surveyed have invested in boosters and receivers to improve coverage, while others are using local networks like the, the Sky network in Kulak. <coughs> Investment in these and other technologies will help improve access, but only where the benefits justify what can be substantial outlays. So those are some of the data that we've collected. Um, the idea isn't just to confirm some well-known issues. Our plan from here is to investigate the links between farm performance and the use of ICT with a view to informing debate um, and infrastructure and R&D investment decisions. So this work will happen over the coming months and will require us to interrogate the data quite carefully. For example, we don't fully understand the nature of the problems caused by poor connectivity. So what are the impediments? How much do they cost? Do they relate to home or paddock-based applications and so on? Thanks for your time.